There are probably rarely movies that are pitch perfect in their storytelling and completely free of plot holes, inconsistencies or implausibilities in the narrative that sometimes require a little bit of contrivance. And the Bond movies, of course, are no exception. Sometimes these plot holes are very minor and really only come up when you really start to think about them. Like, why was Anya so surprised in The Spy Who Loved Me when Bond's Lotus turned into a submarine, yet five minutes later she claims to have seen the blueprints of the car a couple of years ago? And other times these plot holes are more glaring. Like, how was it supposed to make sense that Plenty O'Toole somehow ended up in Tiffany Case's pool in Diamonds Are Forever if you weren't aware about the deleted scene linking these characters together? So, following the four episodes already made in this series so far, we are taking a look at one plot hole in every Bond movie. Let's go. When Bond is escaping through the air ventilation system in Dr. No and is suddenly flooded by all the water, he then leaves the pipework through a metal grill into a passageway. So, shouldn't the water have gone this same way, flooding the exit way? In From Russia With Love, we know Bond deliberately lies to Tanya about the date the embassy would be bombed so he can get the lector. He tells her they are going to do it on the 14th, while they actually do it on the 13th. He does this as just another precaution to make sure the opposition doesn't catch him. So how was Grant still able to plan an elaborate escape route on the Orient Express a day earlier when he couldn't have possibly been aware of Bond's plan? A big question in Goldfinger is why does Goldfinger decide to explain his elaborate plan in great detail using a scaled model only for the gangsters to be killed right after his villain scheme was fully explained. It seems like a whole lot of effort for this huge presentation when you're just gonna get rid of all the people anyway. And how did Bond get his jetpack on the roof of Jacques Beauvoir's mansion so quickly in Thunderbolt? If he flew up there, shouldn't everybody have heard him? It didn't seem to be that much of a long drive either for Beauvoir to make it from the funeral back to his mansion. And furthermore, Bond left after Beauvoir left, so he must have been ridiculously fast without getting hurt or spotted for this to be plausible. You won't find much Bond fans who disagree that the Japanese disguise is completely ridiculous within the plot of the movie, but Bond uses it to somehow maintain a cover of being an ordinary Japanese fisherman. But not only do Blofeld's goons still spot their house anyway, he uses this cover to go to a deserted island and swim underwater. Had he only worn a frog suit or anything like that, he would have still achieved exactly the same result in this mission. But what's even more bizarre is how Bond is still in his Japanese disguise when he's making his way up to the volcano. Yet when he's in front of Blofeld inside of the volcano, the filmmakers seem to have forgotten about his disguise as his hair and makeup are completely back to normal. Furthermore, at the end of the movie, his chest hair is completely back as well, which was heavily implied to be shaven off during the transformation scene. Honor Majesty's Secret Service holds one of the most infamous plot holes of the series in the fact that Bond and Blofeld meet each other, and Blofeld doesn't recognize Bond. While they clearly have already supposed to have met for the first time in the previous movie. This is explained in the fact that Majesty's is a very faithful adaptation of its novel counterpart, where this was the first real instance in the official novel continuity in which Bond would meet this villain. Viewing the film as a standalone, it still works absolutely fine, but seeing the series as a whole, it becomes quite the plot hole. I did do a little video a while ago with a method to make sense of all of this without subscribing to the often disliked codename theory. Check that video out if you're interested. What is the reason in Diamonds Are Forever that Blofeld had a model of his oil rig in Baja, California installed in his penthouse? This only leads to Bond finding out exactly where he was going. 
As far as Blofeld was concerned, there simply was not a single logical reason to display his secret base out in the open over here. Did you ever wonder how exactly Bond got away from the airport scene in Live and Let Die? He was being chased by a bunch of goons when he steals the plane with Mrs. Bell in there. He never killed nor defeated all of the henchmen who were only seen ducking away from the plane in the previous shot. Sure, Bond parks the plane for a funny one-liner, but the film just ends the scene there. All of the goons should still be able to easily catch up with the parked plane from here. One of the most bizarre plot holes is Hip driving away from Bond with his nieces in The Man with the Golden Gun. Why is an ally just leaving Bond behind at the mercy of the bad guys like that? The nieces are even screaming to Hip that they left Bond behind. Isn't he aware? There is one explanation though. Hip is a moron. I have to include one where I go ridiculously unnecessarily deep for one of the greatest Bond films in the series. So just for the sake of it, we're going to be reaching here. In The Spy Who Loved Me, we find out from Fekas' agenda that he has an appointment with Max Kalba on August the 3rd, meaning we know this movie takes place in the summer. A few days after these events, Anya finds out that Bond has killed her lover in the Austrian Alps. Bangarten. When was this? About three weeks ago, why? Technically speaking, it would have been very unlikely that Bond could have been skiing the Austrian Alps in Bangarden in the middle of the summer. But yeah, who cares? That opening is simply badass. Near the end of Moonraker, Bond addresses a question that was also on our minds. Why did Drax steal back his own Moonraker shuttle in the beginning of the movie? And the filmmakers had Drax explain this away with this reasoning. You delivered a shuttle to the US government. Then you hijacked it. Why? Because I needed it. One of my own Moonrakers developed a fault during assembly. So one of Drax's Moonrakers developed a fault, so he needed it back. The bigger question is, why did Drax go through the hassle of stealing it back? Why didn't he just contact whoever he needed before the Moonraker shuttle left on top of the plane and have his Moonraker shuttle safely return to base before it left? If you argue he only found out that the other shuttle malfunctioned when it was already too late and the Moonraker was already being shipped by then, that clearly wasn't the case because he did have time to plan for those two hijackers to come on board of his own Moonraker shuttle, so he definitely knew before it left. If he didn't allow his Moonraker shuttle to have been taken in the first place, he would have never had the British government investigate him. In For Your Eyes Only, we learn that the ATAC is expendable for the British, as it was already supposed to have been self-destructed in the beginning of the movie had it not been for the flooding. Furthermore, Bond destroys the ATAC at the end of the film. The biggest challenge was making sure the ATAC did not fall into the wrong hands. So why doesn't Bond, instead of disarming the self-destruct on the water, set a time charge or a grenade in the room when he easily has the chance, preventing the bad guys from getting their hands on it? When Bond entered the train compartment in Octopussy, he somehow got dressed into the gorilla suit without being heard nor seen. How did he possibly do this? Even if you completely accept that Bond somehow did all of this without making any sounds whatsoever. Sneaking into the compartment by opening the roof panel alone should have totally amplified the train noise already alerting the knife throwing dude. After Bond and Tibbet did the sneaking around in Zorin's secret laboratory, why did the two decide to spend another night there? They would have known that the two guards they fought would inform Zorin that they were snooping around there. Furthermore, their objective was complete. They already found out how Zorin was winning the horse racing with the secret steroids. Trying to maintain their cover from here is pointless and pretty much suicide. In the living daylights, Necros had absolutely no way of knowing that Bond and Saunders had arranged to be meeting at the cafe at the carnival in Vienna when they did. 
let alone have the time to set up the elaborate booby trap to kill Saunders. Not only did Saunders suggest the meeting place only a few hours before, Nekros was still in Tangier with Whitaker and Koskov pretty much on the same day, meaning he took a 5 hours or plus flight from Tangier to Vienna and somehow tracked down Saunders and found out where they were meeting and set up the elaborate booby trap. It's pretty implausible. Fans of my channel know that License to Kill is subjectively my favorite Bond film and I never claimed it to be the best Bond film, just one I seem to enjoy the most. And coincidentally, this happened to be the one Bond film I struggled the most with to find a decent plot hole. There were minor ones for sure, but I guess the one that always stood out to me the most is the fact that Felix Leiter is so cheerful at the end of the film. Yeah, my newly wet wife was just brutally raped and murdered and my freaking legs were gruesomely bit off, but hey, life's good. Even I have a tough time defending that one. I always felt that GoldenEye's pre-title sequence was both highly flawed and highly entertaining. Of course, you can point out the geographical continuity era of Bond jumping down a dam and ending up on top of a mountain when he exits. But probably even more implausible is the stage death of 006. The more you think about it, the less it makes sense. So Alec and Oromov staged his death to make Bond believe he was killed. First of all, did Uromov shoot Alec with a blank, which still seems dangerous from such a close range, or did he simply shoot a little bit to the right? Second, why would Uromov go through the trouble of making Bond believe that Alec was killed if they were just going to kill Bond anyway? And if Alec was secretly already on Uromov's side, why was he helping Bond to shoot down his men? Or Alec was in fact still on the good side when all of this happened and he only betrayed Bond after the timer was set to only 3 minutes and he wanted revenge against Bond and only got Uramov on his side later. Well if that was the case then how did he survive the gunshot to the head? In Tomorrow Never Dies, Bond's gadget laden BMW is shown to have special armor that couldn't be damaged by sledgehammers or machine guns. Yet, moments later, when Bond jumps into the car for action, the machine guns are suddenly able to completely damage the car now and the windshield breaks easily. What happened to the special armoring? Is the armor only active when Bond isn't using the car? Wouldn't it be convenient for him to use the special armor when he's in action? You could argue that they may have been using heavier weapons during the chase than they did during the break-in. But both were very similarly heavy machine guns and that rocket flies through only when the machine guns already broke the windshield. One of the most badass kills in the entire series is Bond killing Elektra in cold blood in The World Is Not Enough. But notice how she's on the radio with Renard moments before her death. Yes. Die, Bond! <laughs> Later on in the movie, however, Renard is absolutely surprised that Bond has killed Elektra and goes berserk. Why was he surprised by this? A gunshot is way louder than her voice. It's very implausible that he didn't hear the gunshot. And even if the walkie-talkie only transmitted when Elektra pushed a certain button, so Renard missed the gunshot just before she was killed, shouldn't he at least be wary that she quickly warmed him with dive Bond and clearly signaling that Bond was standing right in front of her and all of a sudden she isn't to be heard on the radio anymore. Renard doesn't even seem to bother to try and contact her anymore after she suddenly stopped answering and simply is fully surprised when Bond tells him about her death. Dine or Day, of course, in itself could almost be regarded as one giant plot hole where very little makes sense. Pretty much everything in the plot can be questioned. How did Gustav Graves manage to build his reputation? An ice palace, a weaponized satellite only in 14 months. Why did Zhao never bother to have those diamonds removed from his face when he was in the middle of changing his appearance? Shouldn't it be 
Step one to remove your most prominent feature if you want to change what you look like? How did Gustav Graves go from Iceland to North Korea so quickly without being intercepted by any of the countless international countries he flew over? But I think with Die Another Day, nothing makes any logical sense and this is called one plot hole in every Bond film after all. So let's just try and actually go along with their logic. The invisible car. Let's just say we completely buy this incredible logic. I mean Bond's car has turned into a submarine in the past. We all accepted that one. So let's just accept this one. Tiny cameras are fitted on both sides of the cars and project the image on the other side. So I guess these tiny cameras are also somehow placed on the rubber tires then as they also go invisible. Again, let's just say we accept all of this. What is the reasoning to send Bond to Iceland with an invisible car if he's just gonna be leaving freaking tire marks in the snow? What's the point of being covert there? That's like Harry Potter putting on his invisibility cloak in the desert. You would still leave footprints. The movie even shows the tire marks in the snow and yet the bad guys somehow still need the thermal vision to follow him. It's ridiculous. In contrast, Casino Royale is a near perfect Bond film, arguably the best in the franchise and certainly one of my favorites. However, you could say the mission of bankrupting Le Chief does not make any logical sense when you start to overthink it. Thanks to Bond foiling Le Chief's plan of blowing up the Skyfleet plane, preventing the raising of the stocks and thus the funding of terrorist money. MI6 now knows exactly who's behind this and where Le Chief is going to be. He's guilty and they can bring him in. But instead of doing that, they now want Bond to play cards against him. Fair and square too. They're not going to fix the game for him or anything. MI6 knows he's guilty. Does the poker game make Le Chief somehow more guilty? They just reason that if Le Chief loses, he will be completely desperate for protection from his creditors. But he's already completely out of money now. Why risk this whole mission if it wouldn't prove more than they already know and would just result in Le Chief being in exactly the same financial position he's already in at the beginning? It seems like a huge risk, especially considering MI6 could financially fund terrorism if Bond fails. The fact that Quantum of Solace was influenced by the 2008 writer's strike is no secret. Lots of plot points in the film are set up to be quite significant but lead absolutely nowhere. An example of this is Bond's breakthrough in his mission of identifying lots of prominent members within Quantum at the opera sequence, taking pictures of all sorts of important faces. This plot point continues in the way that Bond visits Mathis Place in Italy to try and identify them. One of the important members brought to our attention is Guy Haynes. That's Guy Haynes. You don't know him? Should I? I mean, it's a really good question by Bond, seeing as how we spend a lot of time building all of this up and how the movie comes to a point of even naming one of these members, you would of course assume that Guy Haynes would play a significant part in the rest of Bond's mission. This however is the last mention we get of him. The identifying of these faces becomes entirely pointless and goes nowhere. Bond may as well have identified Peter Griffin here and the movie would have played out in exactly the same way. Though Skyfall is generally one of Daniel Craig's most praised Bond films, there's no denying that you need a lot of contrivance to swallow the villain scheme. Silva supposedly planned his escape to a T and relied on a lot of circumstances and variables purely based on coincidence, knowing he would be captured at the island knowing he would be placed into the secret underground MI6 building, somehow knowing that the new Q would plug his laptop into the system so he could escape. At an exact time, knowing Bond would follow him and having explosive charges be planted at a particular point of the tunnel so he could blow up the wall at the exact time he calculated beforehand 
that Bond would be chasing him at the exact point of the timetable of one of the subway trains that would fall through the wall, knowing he would end up at M's hearing at the exact day she would be there. It's a lot. Somehow he was able to plan all of this out, yet he did not anticipate the fire extinguishers. Of course, for Spectre, there is plenty to point out in how ridiculous it is that Blofeld turned out to be Bond's stepbrother in Daniel Craig's Bond continuity. But instead, did you also notice that Blofeld is constantly setting up death traps for Bond that he somehow is fully expecting him to survive? Why did Blofeld send out his new best hitman in Mr. Hinks on the train if he also fully expected Bond to perfectly arrive at the crater base? Even taking the time and energy of sending out a car for him, decorating a room for him and Madeline complete with their childhood pictures and a welcoming reception. So if he expected Bond to simply survive a fight with Hinks, why would he send Hinks out to his death in the first place? The same holds for the climax. How did Blofeld know that Bond would overpower the guards in the security fan? Because he did go through the hassle of spray painting his name on the MI6 building's wall and he did bother to print out all of the important people to Bond's life and stand behind a big piece of bulletproof glass. What if Bond never defeated those guards? Would Blofeld just end up waiting behind that glass this whole time? With No Time to Die, of course, it's pretty popular to point out how stupid it seems that the nanobots somehow cannot be wiped out by the EMP watch, or how Bond would never give up in the way that he does at the end of the movie. But a plot hole immediately apparent to me, straight from our first viewing in cinema, was the reveal of Bond having a daughter. My first thought was, so who took care of the child this whole time Madeline was in London just now? It's not like Madeline had any next of kin left to take care of her. It also doesn't seem like Madeline brought her daughter with her during this time in the UK. Furthermore, how did MI6 never notice that Madeline was pregnant or had a daughter this whole time while she's been a key communicator to Blofeld these past couple of years? It's all very strange. So that's it today for nitpicking my favorite movie franchise. What did you think of the plot holes I laid out here? Which ones can easily be explained and which ones are totally implausible? Of course, there could have been more plot holes I could have mentioned here, like why didn't Wei Lin uncuff her handcuffs before the bike chase in Tomorrow Never Dies, as she was able to use her earring quite easily to do so after the chase? How was Stromberg able to fire the missiles of these stolen submarines if he didn't have the official launch codes to do so? Why did Dr. No order Professor Dent to plant a tarantula in Bond's room to kill him if tarantulas aren't deadly animals? You know, there is just so much more. I hope you enjoyed the fifth edition to this spontaneous series. Be sure to check out the other episodes as well, as well as the other content on my channel. Please subscribe and check out my Patreon page if you are interested in going the extra mile and support the channel in return of plenty of great channel perks. See you guys in the next video.